Great. I think we're going, uh, I don't know what we're on now, but halfway through the subtle knife and I'm back with uh, Gabriel Shank. Uh, how's it going, Gabe? Hello. I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. Good. I wanted to ask you first, uh, and we were just talking about this a little bit, what you've been up to since we last spoke uh, last fall now. Um, any new projects, any new developments uh, on things that you've been working on? Yeah, sort of. Yeah. So um, thank, firstly, thank you very much for having me back. It's, it's really delightful to be back um, on your show and also to be talking about Phil Pullman related things. Um, since last fall, I, uh, I, well, I worked in London for a bit and then uh, I've been um, precepting at Signum University. So I did a course on Gothic literature, which is what I was doing when we last spoke. And then uh, the following term, I did a course on H.P. Lovecraft, which was great fun. And then I um, co-taught a lecture series on, um, sorry, let me just close down my, uh, uh, my WhatsApp, which is making all kinds of noises. <laughs> I co-taught a uh, lecture series on the Inklings and King Arthur. Uh, for Signum University, which is now available for auditing, if you want to uh, download the uh, the lectures and sort of read along as you as you uh, listen to the lectures, you can do. Um, and that was so that was like uh, C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and Barfield and Williams um, writing about King Arthur. Oh, cool! And so that was the first time you've taught that class, or yes, first time anyone's taught that class because because we we made it up. I mean, it was all based on. Um, on this excellent book, actually, uh, The Inklings and King Arthur, uh, Serena Higgins, well, uh, uh, Professor Higgins edited this book and then inside um, different authors wrote the chapters based on this kind of huge subject area because Inklings is massive. Yeah. Inklings being the, the, the name of the literary group that included Tolkien and Lewis and, and several others. And then King Arthur, of course, is a massive, massive um subject as well so uh it's surprising that it's only this thick um that i'm sure they could have filled 10 volumes if they wanted to that's excellent and yeah i know that a lot of signum people were involved in that project um contributed yeah. essays and uh helped with the research and, and production of the book um yeah. and i think it won an award didn't it it did it won the methopedic award um so it was yeah it was really cool to teach a class based on that book and we refer to it as the textbook but we sort of did our own thing with the course as well because it is such a big topic and, and very rich and did things like uh talking to the fall of arthur and c.s lewis's um that hideous strength and uh charles williams wrote a lot of arthurian poetry and mm. um, an arthurian novel as well so it was, it was good fun a lot of reading but good fun that's a yeah. That's a subject I will want to delve into more at some point. I I was trying to follow along. Um, Corey Olson was doing a Mythgard Institute uh, series on Mallory's yeah. uh, more Darthur, and I stuck with it for quite a ways. But I couldn't I couldn't hang at, at a certain point. I I got lost, and um, I've never read the entirety of that. But I I want to. Uh, I I enjoyed you know what I did read and. Uh, fully intend to go back to it. So I see you've got it there. Yeah, um, well, I mean, I was, if you're talking about big books, I mean, you could kill a man <laughs> with this. The, um, Arthur Beardsley um, illustrated version of Le Morte d'Arthur. That's so uh, with excellent. With beautiful kind of um, Art Nouveau illustrations. Oh, this wow. Is like the end of the 19th century. I think Art Nouveau is the right term. Um, this is maybe a better example. Yeah, it's got that kind of allusion to the medieval style almost but yeah but it, and it's time stylized. yeah very much of its time in late 19th century early 20th century that was a version that c.s lewis had as a teenager so yeah i'm glad you brought up lewis's reading habits because that's somewhere i was kind of interested to start this discussion um so I, like i said I'm, I'm about halfway through the subtle knife now in my my podcast uh doing this kind of analysis of it and I came across a, um, a little detail that I hadn't really noticed before uh, about where they are when they're in the Tower of Angels, right? Um, but, I, but before we get to that, there's this passage that Pullman quotes from Lewis in a few of his talks and essays. He, he quotes this passage about Lewis describing his enjoyment of the world of a story. 
um, that he reads stories not just for the kinds of feelings that they evoke, like suspense or excitement or whatever, but for the feeling of being in a particular kind of environment, right? And he describes yeah. it as like snowshoes and Hiawatha names is, is the phrase that seems to have stuck with Pullman because he likes to kind of use it um, when he talks about, you know, this distinction uh, between readers who might read just for the sheer, you know, enjoyment of the story and readers who read with a kind of uh, appreciation of the world that the story takes place in, something like mm -hmm. this. I think mm -hmm. it's in the essay on stories. Uh, yeah, by, that's right. Yeah, so so you're familiar. So um, yeah. Pullman seems to be the 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 sort of author who who likes to conjure an entire world, right? And he seems to um, go to great lengths to make that world feel uh, vibrant, um, feel immersive, and, and um, that's a big part of the power of his story. Um, Maybe that's just because I'm the sort of reader who who likes that thing. But but anyway, um, the example that that I'd throw out there for you is that when Will cuts through for the first time uh, with the subtle knife into his own world again, right? From the world of Chittagatsi back into his own world. They're they're high up in the tower, and so they're high above North Oxford. They're over a cemetery, in fact, looking back toward the city. They can see the hornbeam trees a little way ahead, the houses, trees, roads. And in the distance, the towers and spires of the city, which is, you know, the famous dreaming spires of Oxford, right, off in yep. the distance there. So, so that passage, you, you said you can identify for us that graveyard. And um, oh, yeah. maybe you can, we'll, we'll just sort of start there and, and kind of go on a little bit of a tour of uh, sure. the Oxford of Pullman's story. So, so where is that? Where, where are they? Well, I, I should explain to listeners um, that I'm, I'm not just big headed. Uh, I live in Oxford. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, I went to a uh, university in Oxford uh, for my PhD, but I, but I'm, I, I, I'm both town and gown. Um, so there's this kind of distinction between town, people who live there and the gown, which is like, as in the academic gown, people are at the university and sort of, you know, throughout time, like in the, the kind of thousand year history of Oxford university, town and gown have had this tension and there's been riots and there's been, people have been killed and so on. I've been going back, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. It's all much better now. <laughs> um, so, but, but I, I'm, uh, you know, if I'm, if I may be so bold, I have the perspective of, of both. Uh, and so, um, uh, hopefully I, I am well equipped to give all of you a tour of Oxford as we, as we look through um, the way that Pullman uses Oxford as a, as a scene. And I, I think as a character as well, mm. I, I mean, I do agree um, that, uh, you know, Pullman is interested in that kind of the, the world of the story like C.S. Lewis is. I, I, I know that essay on stories very well. I hadn't realized that Philip Pullman references it. Is it, is it in Demon Voices? He yes, I think it, I think it's, Reference twice in Demon okay. Voices, um, at least a couple of different places it pops up in his, his essays and speeches and things. Um, so that's, that's very interesting. And um, because, of course, Pullman is, is famously anti C.S. Lewis. <laughs> yes. Um, I went to a talk a few months ago at the Oxford C.S. Lewis Society. It was given by um, Dr. Michael Ward, who is a, a very famous and oh yeah um, very well respected c.s lewis scholar he wrote the planet uh, planet narnia which is this great kind of um, scholarly book on the narnia series uh and the, he gave a talk on philip pullman which is called something like um philip pullman on c.s lewis what's wrong with him um <laughs> and it, it wasn't particularly um non-biased but it was it was it was all about kind of refuting pullman's arguments sure against lewis um but uh, yeah, so it's interesting to hear that Pullman's citing Lewis, um, and unlike that uh, that uh, essay, I think there might be a difference. I I, I was rereading bits of Pullman in preparation for this, and I was struck by how in every description of place, it's through the eyes of a character, mm. um, and he really puts his characters first. Um, there's no kind of decadence in in kind of. Uh, how Oxford is described either in Will's Oxford or Lyra's Oxford. We see Will's Oxford through the eyes of someone who's hiding and um, worried about his mother. We see Lyra's Oxford through the eyes of a girl who's playing games. Um, and I do think that perhaps Pullman treats 
Oxford and other places as well, like Svalbard, as characters in their own rights. Mm. Um, so we see them through the eyes of characters, but they are also characters themselves. Um, and so we, I, I, as you sort of hinted at, we, we kind of get glimpses of character throughout this, just as you would for the human character. You sort of, you, there's little moments when you're like, oh, okay, we've seen a bit of that, that character. And there is one such moment in The Subtle Knife, which you refer to, which is, I'd completely forgotten until you told me about it and reminded me. Um, the, the Will and Lyra are in, how, how, how do you even pronounce it? Sitikazi? I, I put it a, 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 an Italian soft C with the ch sound because I like how it sounds. Chittagazzi. That's how I say it. Chittagazzi. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, it, I, I mean, because it's a parallel world, I suppose we can call it whatever we like. Yeah. Uh, Chittagazzi. But then, yeah, so, so then Will uses the subtle knife to create a portal um, into his Oxford. And the quotation is, because they were high in the tower, they were high above North Oxford. Over a cemetery, in fact, looking back towards the city. There were the hornbeam trees a little way ahead of them. There were houses, trees, roads, and in the distance, the towers and spires of the city. Now, um, one thing to, to note about that passage is, firstly, the hornbeam trees really are there. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and, I mean, for example, there's actually a... If you've got this wonderful book, Lyra's Oxford, it comes with this fake postcard. I love that. Yes. I love that stuff in the end of that book. Um, yeah. And then you see the hornbeam trees there that those are the hornbeam trees. Right. Right. Um, uh, so um, I used to live very close to them. And I, I, I go past these hornbeam trees every like several times a week on my bike. Um, it's a, it's a long road. You can look this up on Google maps actually. Uh, it connects Banbury Road and Woodstock Road and but the the farthest reach of North Oxford. Sure. Um, and, and these kind of strange hornbeam trees, which do look kind of like something from a, a set, as Philip Gorman describes them in, yes, in The yes. Sun Life. Just beyond that is Wilvercote, Wilvercote Cemetery. Um, oh, and it, wow. it's very, very clear where this is. Um, if you know Oxford, you know, you know, like, okay, hornbeam trees there. Yep, the next cemetery along, okay, that's got to be Wilvercote. And he even gives you the perspective. So you know it's, it's looking south towards the hornbeam trees and then towards the rest of Oxford. Um, so it's definitely, definitely Wilvercote Cemetery. Um, it's a very large cemetery. It's where J.R.R. Tolkien is buried. Oh. Um, it's where Roger Bannister recently has, has, has been buried. So Roger Bannister was the man who, who ran um, the, a mile in under four minutes, I think it is. Uh -huh. He was master of Pembroke College. Uh, who else is buried there? Uh, Father John Tolkien and and members of my family actually. I, I was there the other weekend, uh, showing someone Tolkien's family graveyard graves as well because the the Shanks. My my surname is Shank, and mm -hmm. it seems like they buried people alphabetically, so part of the graveyard. Um, Although I'm not Catholic myself, but family members have been. Uh, so um, that's the graveyard he's referring to. And it's a little kind of reference, take it or leave it. If you don't know Oxford, it doesn't really mean anything to you. But if you know Oxford, you know exactly where you are at that point. And it's, it's a really nice kind of moment where you can sort of position yourself in the story. Oh, well, I, I mean, I definitely take it as being, you know, intentional, even though he goes out of his way, the narrator to sort of, throw it away with that little in fact, right? Um, yeah. In a way that sort of draws your attention to it the more, um, the idea of it being a graveyard or a cemetery, um, I think is also sort of hinted at um, in the description of the, the colors along the edge of the subtle knife. Um, there's, oh. there's a kind of wonderful description there and the, um, the, the term of, of graveyard comes up there too, I want to say, um, that there's shadow colors. Um, yeah, the, the clustering shades at the mouth of a tomb as evening falls over a deserted graveyard. Uh, this, is, this is, I think, not a coincidence that a few pages later then, you know, he situates them in this particular spot above this, this graveyard so that they can look back at the city that, you know, will, of course is worried about, you know, um, what's going on back in his world. Um, 
it's where Lyra is from, right? As you say, it's her kind of childhood uh, haunts, the, those, those towers. She would run along the rooftops. Um, and, and so I think there, there's something very interesting there, um, whether, whether you want to get to sort of the specifics of, of the place, which are interesting in themselves, right? Uh, or, or just sort of the thematic quality of, of, of positioning us in that particular spot. Um, yeah, it's a, it, it's a really nice detail actually, and it does remind me of Lyra's Lyra playing in the in the tombs of uh, Jordan College. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, Pullman is clearly interested in crypts and graveyards, and and that that amazing description as well, abandoned, um, an abandoned um, a, no, sorry, a deserted graveyard. Well, d- d- I mean, abandoned would make more sense because you can abandon a graveyard. Can you desert a graveyard? Does, what, is it, what is a deserted graveyard? It, it means that there's no people there, but why would there be people anyway? Does it mean that there are no dead bodies? Um, it, it, it's a strange concept. A deserted graveyard is just a graveyard. Like no one's <laughs> going to be living there. Um, but I, but I, I mean, it, it's interesting. I mean, the, the, yeah, I can't imagine what a deserted graveyard really means. The, the one at Wolvercote is very prim and proper, and it's, it, there's always quite a lot of people there. It's a huge graveyard. It's quite manicured. There's another graveyard, Hollywell Cemetery um, in Oxford, where Charles Williams is buried um, and various other people. And that is kind of abandoned and sort of ramshackle. And um, there was a competition in, a few years ago. I can't remember if I mentioned this last time, um, but there was a competition, write 500 words fiction on, uh, on Oxford. And I chose to write about Hollywell Cemetery um, because, and this is true, um, a homeless person lives there um, in a tent. And I thought that was kind of interesting. The other thing about that graveyard is that it is, it is almost deserted, whatever deserted graveyard means. It's all kind of like everything's falling apart and the ivy's covered all the graves and so on. And uh, anyway, the, this, this story, this bit of flash fiction was chosen as one of the winners by Philip Pullman. Oh, um, who congrats. else? I mean, I, I, I didn't actually think about it at the time. I wasn't like, oh, let's write something about graveyards because Philip Pullman likes them. Um, I just, I was interested in that idea myself. But obviously, that was probably why he picked it as one of the winners because he, he has a thing for these kind of um, these cemeteries, which I, I hadn't really thought of before. That's really cool. I, I, I congratulate you on your ability to. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, get him to read something that you wrote. That's like amazing. Yeah, and, and it was a nice moment because um, he's, he's pretty much my favorite author. Yeah. Of all time. It was nice to think that he'd read something I'd written uh, other amazing. than an email because I've, I've sent him a few emails as well. But um, yeah, it was, it was cool that he valued something I'd, I'd written. But I think, you know, it does tie in with, with that idea that he's interested in as well. And it's an idea in, in Oxford generally. I mean, there's a fantastic book about Oxford. It, it, called these ruins are inhabited Hmm. because there is a sort of sense that all these colleges and uh, you know all these old buildings are kind of was almost um you know built hundreds centuries ago by people who are long since dead you're you're almost sort of living in a necropolis in some ways yeah well that I, i like that you brought up the skulls in the crypt under jordan college that is one of the first instances of seeing Lyra kind of in her element, right? Um, doing something dangerous, uh, making Roger uncomfortable and making Pan very uncomfortable too. And then she has a nightmare about it later, repents, goes back, um, fixes the, the mess that she's made. Um, I, I think more than a nightmare. I mean, I think the ghosts actually come out. I'm and, sure. I mean, but, but I mean, it's debatable in, in uh, Northern Lights. It could just be a nightmare uh, because she, she takes the coins and she swaps them around and then the ghosts come out. Right. And, and it does, it, it's a bit debatable in Northern Lights whether that's, um, uh, that's, that really happens. But then when you read La Belle Sauvage, it, it, it's clear that there is a kind of supernatural, a kind of wild supernatural element that exists in Lyra's world. Yeah. So I think if you go back and read Golden Compass slash Northern Lights again, that ghost thing seems to be more obviously, no, that really happened. That, that there are ghosts in Lyra's world that actually um, have sentience and so on. No, yeah, I, I, I think that's fair. Like the, the idea that the, um, the skulls there are some kind of uh, preparation though, or, or parallel to this other graveyard imagery 
or the skulls um, that she's she's looking at in the museum, right? Yeah. Um, the trepan skulls. Uh, you mentioned, I think, last time that uh, you got to go and see Pullman give a, a talk at one of those museums. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if it was the same one where, where Lyra's supposed to be, um, but, but that, I think, is a really clear example of the idea of the kind of necropolis or, or mausoleum feel of the city itself, right? That the past is there. It's, um, it's very sort of just under the surface. And, and it's, yeah. it's a thing that sort of um, is part of the attraction of Oxford, right? This great past, this great heritage uh, of, of tradition and wisdom, knowledge that, that's passed on there. Um, but yeah, so could you talk a little bit about what it's like to be in that museum if, if you have been in, in that Sure, museum? sure. Oh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm there all the time. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing to very quickly say for any listeners who aren't so sort of familiar with Oxford is, is that anything that Pullman describes in our Oxford is real. Wow. So um, the trap and skulls are really there. You can go and see them. There's a whole kind of display case. They're on one side of the display case. On the other side are shrunken heads. It's this incredible museum called the Pit Rivers. Um, highly recommend it. Um, the way you get into the Pit Rivers is you go through the Natural History Museum, which is described in The Southern Life. She go, Lyra goes through the Natural History Museum. And then the, the way it's described in The Southern Life is that she goes into another section of the museum. Yes. Now that's actually technically wrong, but it's right from Lyra's perspective. This is going back to what I'm saying about everything's filtered through a character's perspective. Uh, Pit Rivers is actually technically, it's a, sep it's a completely separate museum, but it seems you go through a door and you're suddenly in this other museum. It's a museum within a museum. Mm. Um, but it, it, to a child, to, well, to, to someone of Lyra's age, it would just seem like, oh, this is a different section of the same museum. Um, Pitt Rivers is very different though. So um, at Natural History Museum, you go in, it's incredibly Victorian. It's, it's got this really high roof. It's got massive dinosaurs. It's got do a dodo skeleton, all these uh, dinosaur bones, all these um, uh, statues of Darwin and people like that. It's got an amazing um, carved uh, entrance of Adam and Eve, actually, which I, I didn't even notice for the first time I was there uh, a few weeks ago. Um, if you do go and visit, the other fun thing to look at kind of intricate carving on the outside of the building, there's a point where the carving just stops and that's where they ran out of money. And there's quite a few areas of Oxford where you can see, ah, that's where they ran out of money. The Divinity School and the Bodleian Library is another example. You can see this very beautiful intricate carving and then it just stops. And it's like the other windows are done, but that part is, is has stopped like midway. Uh, they ran out of money. Um, that's a common thing. Uh, so you go through this museum and it's, it's very big and it's, it's, uh, very open and then you go into the pit rivers and it's the complete opposite it's it's very dark it's very enclosed you are surrounded by all these different exhibits um it's an anthropological museum and it's basically like a museum of the british empire in some ways in, in that it's it's like we just took all this stuff for, yeah. i mean that's what a museum is in general like people just taking stuff i guess but like pit rivers is is just that times a hundred, you know, you see like just the spoils of, of the British empire everywhere. Um, shrunken heads, trap and skulls, Fijian armor. Um, uh, it, everything's arranged thematically rather than chronologically. So you see, um, a whole display case about throwing knives that will have like a, an Aboriginal boomerang and a Korean throwing knife. Um, it's something from, uh, 2,000 years ago next to something from five years ago. Um, it, everything sort of grouped together in that way. So it's a, it's a fantastic museum. There's also these drawers that you can pull out and you can find more stuff. And there's weird things like there's a um, hot cross bun from 1987, which was used as a part of a magic spell. There's a, um, a bottle that said to contain a witch and nobody's ever opened it in case the, the witch comes out. So Pullman is really scratching the surface when he yeah. does something like the trap and skulls, he could, he could spend a whole novel in that museum. If you want. I did the first time I, I went to a Philip Pullman talk was in that museum is technically in the natural history museum, but he, he talked about it as the museum where the trap and skulls are. Uh, and it was kind of exciting because it was, it was um, after hours, we, we got to go into the museum 
after it had closed. I actually went to two talks by Pullman there. One was um, uh, just before Amber Spyglass came out, and one was um, for the launch of Lyra's Oxford, but just, yeah. just after it had come out. Um, Pullman is giving a talk in Oxford for uh, the Secret Commonwealth. He's only doing one. Um, he's doing it in the Sheldonian, which is like a big kind of 500 seater lecture theatre. Um, the place I went to in the Natural History Museum is about, it seats about 100 people. So it was much more intimate, but then Pullman wasn't quite as famous as he is now. And also he was a bit younger. So, you know, I think he, my my feeling is that he um he did a lot of publicity for La Belle Sauvage and now he's wanting to do a little bit less for that's, Secret Commonwealth. That's fair. Are you going to be able to make it to the talk? No, because I'm stupid and I, I didn't get organized fast enough and all the tickets sell, sold out. Well, I know the tickets might have gone like that. I mean, um, I would have loved to have gone. But it, it, to be fair, I've I've been to a lot of Phil Pullman talks. I'd love, I'd, obviously, I'd love to go again. I'd love to go to more. But I almost feel like let other people have the chance because <laughs> sure. I've I've done it. Um, but um, I'll show you a few things. This was this the so when the Amber Spy goes. I don't think it had even come out. I, don't know, I can't. It must have come out. It must. It must have. There must have been the launch of this. But um, I went with my friend, Chris Brunner, who I, I talked about last time because yeah. Philip Pullman started giving a, a, telling a story about a family of gibbons who started eating each other. And Chris and I got the giggles because we were only about like, I don't know, 12 or 13 at the time. And then when we were waiting in the queue to get our book signed, um, Chris leant over and he stole the promotional poster for the Amber Spyglass which is this, it was just this um, sitting on the table and he got Philip Pullman to sign it. Um, <laughs> where did Philip Pullman sign it? There we go. It's very hard to see in the, there we go. There's his signature. Awesome. Um, but this is a, this is the rare thing. You know, this is like a kind of. That's got to be one emotion. of a kind. Yeah, probably. I mean, I, I think there probably were more made, but nobody stole them like like we did. And he just leant over and took it and just gave it to Philip Pullman. He just signed it for us, and then we walked out. <laughs> uh, this, this is my copy of the Amber Spyglass. So this is a weird copy because it doesn't have a title. It doesn't have a cover um, title, it's, and it doesn't have a blurb. They did one for the um, Southern Knife like this as well. Um, I mean, there's so many editions of um, his dark materials. Scholastic did a pretty good job uh, pumping out another another version every five seconds. <laughs> um, but this this was the one that uh, uh, Philip Pullman signed that that uh, that night. Oh yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Um, so and then and then we afterwards we wrote to the publisher scholastic and said do you have any other stuff we could have and they sent us this little booklet huh. which is a, a kind of little booklet about oh wow in amazing, amazing detail um so you can see what everything means and then you have like how to read to um the history of the alethiometer i actually i i haven't googled this i don't know if there's i imagine there's a pdf somewhere online if there isn't, I'll, I'll, I should scan this in and put it up because it's a really nice document. Um, and they, just, they just sent us like a bunch of them because we wrote them a letter. <laughs> this was in, in, back in the days before Twitter and email. and Well, I suppose email existed, but we, we wrote them a proper letter and they just posted lots of stuff to us, which is kind of cool. So that's, that's really interesting. When you were talking about the museum as this place where, where stolen things right um, end up and are, are collected, it reminds me of... Uh, the the guild of the subtle knife actually the way that they are become this kind of world of of magpies as they say and they go and they steal stuff and bring it back I think yeah. Pullman, Pullman seems to have a a real fascination with that as well right this idea that that he as a writer as an author is is a kind of his his demon is a, is a magpie that steals bits of story that that there's a kind of um, a good way to do that and maybe a, a bad way to do that, right? Uh, that it, it can cause uh, great destruction in the civilization if that is sort of the only thing that they have going for them in Shirigatsu's case. 
versus mm-hmm. you know something that seems relatively harmless and and really actually kind of awesome like where you have these unique objects which are connected to something that you really care about and you know that yeah. that add to your understanding of something which i think the museum maybe falls somewhere in between uh potentially right I mean, the, the museum has controversy. Like the shrunken heads are very controversial objects in particular. And, and there is a, the countries where they came from yeah. want them back. Mm. They've, they've got, I mean, they've got lots of, they've got stuff I've, I didn't know they had. Like uh, I was in the British Museum and they have the um, Benin, Benin um, bronzes from Nigeria. And that's a kind of a controversial object in the British Museum. Um, and, uh, but I, I hadn't realized until I was there the other day that the pit rivers have quite a lot of that stuff as well. Um, so yeah, there is, I, I think you're right. It's probably in the middle. It, I mean, it's wonderful for me because I get to see this stuff, but then obviously it's problematic as we say in academia, sure. um, that it's, that it, it, it's housed in Oxford. And of course there's a, there's a history there. There's, um, you know, were these objects, bought were they traded were they just found or were they looted i mean in the case of the bronzes they were actually stolen from nigeria um in uh well what is now modern day nigeria um so yeah it is it is a bit of a problematic place um and and the way pullman describes himself as a magpie is obviously a positive example of that i like the way he expresses it in the at the end of uh i think it's the end of amber spyglass um read what was it write like a read like a butterfly write like a bee yes yes and that's his twitter bio as well <laughs> um, but he, he was saying like you know you read read from lots of things and uh uh yes i have stolen ideas from every book i have ever read he says <laughs> so i mean he phrases it in terms of stealing yes. um and uh, if the story contains it is entirely because of the quality of the necktie found in the work of better writers. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I'm not quite sure what to make of, of that. I guess there is good stealing and bad stealing, I guess. And, and Pitt Rivers is maybe in between. It's, it's bad, it, bad to have stolen from other cultures, but at least we're, we're learning from this and we're kind of, you know, it, it, it's a huge privilege for me living in Oxford that I can just nip across the road and see this amazing stuff all the time. And, cool. and, and um, uh, or be in a place that's been fictionalized in one of my favorite novels. Right. It sounds like he he steals from writers, but he also steals from everything around him. If he's walking through the museum and he sees throwing knives, you know, I could totally imagine that being a, a little bit of the inspiration for the subtle knife. And this idea that, you know, there's a kind of division between town and gown. Um, the idea that there's like layers of um, of the society there, that are, are to be um, navigated is very close to the idea that you actually literally move from one world to another, right? Um, there's yeah, all yeah, kinds yeah. of ways to play with that. He Well, yeah, indeed. But, and, and actually, I mean, th- this makes me think. Um, so the way Will goes into the other world is in North Oxford. It's north of Summertown. Yes. W- what used to exist north of Summertown was a literal wall. Oh, wow. um, I don't know much about this because this is before my time. Um, but Summertown is a very gentrified area, rich, expensive area. And then just there's an area just north of it, which is now actually quite gentrified. But um, historically, it was incredibly poor. And so the way that Oxford dealt with this was they literally put a wall in, um, separating those two pass- uh, areas. I think it's Cuttleso, something like that, um, just north of Summertown. In the, I was in an exhibition at the Bodleian a few weeks ago, all about maps, and there was a map of Oxford, and the the guy was um, the Bodleian librarian was uh, was talking about uh, Oxford and about this wall, and he said that in World War Two, Canadians who were posted to Oxford were so disgusted by the fact that this wall separated that they drove a tank through it, um, but then the wall was rebuilt. I think the wall came down and sort of, I don't know, maybe maybe at the same time as the Berlin Wall, or maybe it was. I'm not, I, I actually don't know the history of that so much. Um, sorry, it's not very good radio to say I don't know the history of that. But it's just I just suddenly thought of it, um, that actually maybe there is a link there. Um, because it, it is in recent memory. I mean, it, it would have been sort of the last few decades that wall came down. Um, and, and certainly sort of even after the wall came down, that the effects of that. Um, even now, I mean, yeah, the further away you, you get from the center of Oxford, the more kind of 
you know the poorer it, it gets and um there is that kind of division so the fact that this boundary this this um uh portal into another world takes place at that part of oxford you know that that area where it is a kind of like boundary between the rich and the poor does seem very deliberate um because set that he could have brought that portal closer to it the heart like, of oxford it, it, it seems it, like it's partly the, the at that point. yeah the image of the hornbeam trees that seems inspirational the idea that there's a boundary right between the end of oxford and and yeah. the suburbs and also I always liked the name Summertown because the world that he conjures is this kind of eternal summer almost, it seems like in Shigatsi, right? It's this kind of Mediterranean, yeah. uh, thing top bars and um, flowers and bougainvillea, right? So I wonder if that name is is somehow relevant. Do you know where the name Summertown comes from or why? I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's a part of England called Somerset and I always thought, okay. well, that's that I, in my head that I've never made m more of a, a link between those two things than that. I'm, I'm sure. I mean, if you, if you, um, I mean, it's funny. I just never thought of it like that because Summertown is just, you know, that's, that's where my great aunt used to live. Um, it's where I lived for a, a year. Sure. Um, it's quite a nice area. I mean, I, I, when you say Summertown, I think, Oh, that's where the Marks and Spencers is. That's a grocery mm -hmm. store. Uh, <laughs> uh it's quite boring it's not the <laughs> land of eternal summer or anything like that <laughs> but it's but it's true it's, it, i forget these things advantage knowing oxford very well reading philip Pullman, but also you forget some of the magic in the names as well like summer town um so uh yeah I, I i'd be curious to know the etymology of that it does sound should we look it up actually rather than make listeners well, go for it. Um, look it up themselves uh, and so I, I'm, let's see. I'm glad you mentioned to um at the start of this, I should have reintroduced you as, you know, who you are and what you're up to um, a little better. But you've you've gone to Oxford University. As you say, you, you grew up there and, and you went to school there. Um, you've got your Oxford T-shirt on, you, yeah. you mentioned. <laughs> uh, could, so once you've, you've discovered and researched the, um, the origin of the name Summertown, could you just say a little bit about, you know, what it was like growing up there and, and then going to school there and being in these these you know these august halls of learning and and, and just like that's just your normal life right <laughs> it's yeah remarkable. i mean yeah it, it is and it isn't um i mean i i grew up in cumner which is where philip Pullman now lives um uh so cumner is just outside oxford and now i live in a in another village called ensham which is again just outside oxford um and growing up near oxford oxford was the place we caught the bus in to go shopping or to go to the cinema sure. and like yeah so the, the university dominates the city but actually the, the university is made up of individual colleges there's 38 colleges and you can almost think of those colleges as miniature universities in their own right and typically a college is a kind of walled off area yes you, again you, the it's almost like a temple or a church you've got you you go through a big door if you can get in, sometimes the door's locked and then you go through and there's all these quadrangles and chapels and stuff in the, in these kind of enclosed areas. Um, I mean, I think there's a reason why people like C.S. Lewis, who was the professor, sorry, he wasn't a professor. He was a fellow at Magdalen College, Oxford. Um, Tolkien was at Merton College and Pembroke College. Um, Pullman was at Exeter mm -hmm. where he met Gerard Tolkien once. Um, and of course, Lewis Carroll was at Christchurch, who wrote the Alice in Wonderland series. There, yes. There's all these authors have this idea of discovering another world. Um, less so talking, actually, because he, he keeps that other world so separate. But Lewis, Lewis Carroll and Pullman all have this idea that you're kind of you're going to go through a portal and you're going to end up in this other world. And that to me is very that going through Oxford feels like that. Like if you take Magdalen College for an as an example, it looks very grand and ostentatious from the outside, but if you go, you go through all the quads, you get to this massive, mass, uh, enormous deer park in the middle of the college, and it's you suddenly realise this is enormous. This college uh, that seems big from the outside, but not quite that big. Um, but you know, it's like going into through the wardrobe into Narnia. Exactly. Um, and Pullman actually, I think, makes he 
by putting the action the portal in in the furthest reaches of north oxford right in the suburbs um and setting it late at night as well and and in amongst these hornbeam trees which are kind of so dull they're kind of notable for how dull they are um he's a he's a kind of doing he's uh he's sort of writing against lewis where kind of his characters sort of get get into to narnia through um a, I, it's a bit more kind of middle class a little a, a little bit more privileged i suppose with, the, with some exceptions the silver chair is that they're running away from bullies but um uh generally it's it they they they're in more comfortable urban not quite urban but sort of domestic uh settings i suppose than portman who's sort of having that portal further further away um mm-hmm. than both c.s lewis and lewis carroll um so anyway uh i mean growing up in oxford i wasn't particularly aware of the university i mean my dad actually went to to oxford as well um and so I, you know, I, I mean, I remember as a child going to Wolfson College and punting along the Thames, um, but really I didn't properly step inside the university as it were until I became a student there. I did my undergraduate at, at Aberystwyth University in Wales and, and also spent a year in Pittsburgh. And then I went um, up north to Durham to do my master's. And then I applied to Oxford, got in. The first time I ever went into Pembroke College, which is the college I was a student at, was after I'd accepted my place there mm-hmm. because they're so um I, I tried I tried to go in to have a look around and I couldn't find the entrance <laughs> was it they're very hidden away and they're not frankly they're not that welcoming yeah yeah um if you do go and visit Oxford I mean you have to know the tricks so if you go to Exeter College which is the inspiration for Jordan College Exeter is where William Morris went and Gerard Joe, Joe Tolkien and Philip Pullman. If you go between two and five, you get it, you just walk in and, and the door will be closed, but you just open the door and you walk through. Mm. You can explore it, you know, it's open to the public between two and 5 p.m. free. You can also go into the fellow's garden. You have to go through another door that looks like you're not supposed to go through it and you walk through um, part of the, the inside of one of the buildings and you get through into the, the fellow's garden and that's got one of the best views of Oxford because it overlooks the camera and, and so on. And you see inside the Divinity School and so on. So it's well worth doing. But you don't know that's there unless, unless you've, you've, someone has shown you. Sure. Um, so there's all kind of these hidden gems. So I, as a child, as a teenager, as a young adult, I wasn't really aware of the kind of august halls, as you put it, um, the kind of hidden away part of it. And I didn't really feel like it was for me. Sure. Um, Oxford without the university is still an interesting place. Um, you know, there's good shopping, there's good like food and restaurants and like parks and stuff. Um, so it's not like I was missing out, but it's basically, uh, it, I, I remember, I remember there, there were times when I looked around and I was like, Oh yeah, this is like something in, in Lord of the Rings or, mm-hmm. um, Azeroth or whatever. But generally even the, you, if you visit somewhere just for a day, you, you notice it more. Yes. Um, if you live there, you think everywhere has these kind of crumbling Gothic um, balustrade. You just, you, at some point, you need to think about going to the bank and depositing your checks and that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, and you don't maybe appreciate it as much. Um, and you get that sense in Philip Pullman as well. You know, Lyra is a, is a, is a girl of the gown in the first book but she's also a girl of the town playing with egyptians who have their own life in port meadow they, they're not like bothered about the university they're not like wandering through these august or um, through the quads of oxford colleges because they wouldn't be allowed in but they're having a fun time in port meadow instead yeah that so that aspect of the again that's sort of on the edges of the town right uh, on the edges of the city um yeah Sort of, but in a different way to to North Oxford. So, yeah. Oxford's very long and and spindly. Yeah. If you look at it on, you can do this on Google Maps. It's like right. it's like it's basically like a giant eye. Um. And so where Will is, is there, and the centre of Oxford is there. Port uh-huh. Meadow is like there. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm not sure this is very clear. It's not that far apart. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
it, 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 yeah, it's not that far apart from the center of Oxford, but it is on the edge, but it's sure. on the edge of the width rather than the height. Yes, yes. And um, so, yeah, you mentioned Will's. Will's home is, is this kind of um, very ordinary place, and, and the hornbeam trees are, are super extra. They're, they're unusually ordinary or something like that, right? Yeah. Whereas uh, Lyra's world in, um, in her Oxford, she's in the midst of the, the kind of ornate architecture and everything and goes, goes away from it to, to find places to play and kids to play with. Um, that, that combination, though, of the two of them gets kind of located in the uh, Botanic Garden uh, eventually at the end of the story, right? They sort of have their whole adventure. And the way that Pullman chooses to, to conclude everything is back there in Oxford, which seems like it makes sense, but at this sort of different place, this different part of Oxford, which again is sort of at the, it seems like the southern extreme of, of the colleges and things, um, the Botanic Garden. Have you walked around there? Have you? Um, oh, yeah, uh, all the time. I mean, I, I again, I was there a few weeks ago. Um, Botanic Garden, yeah. It, I mean, it's it, it. It is sort of the southern extreme of the colleges. I mean, it, it, Oxford continues for quite a long way beyond that, and there are actually one or two colleges beyond that. Um, if you keep on following that road, you get to Blackbird Lees, which is actually not just the most impoverished part of Oxford, but one of the most most impoverished part of the UK. Wow. It's, totally different. Um, it's a huge contrast to the rest of Oxford. It's, it, I don't even know if it would technically be considered part of Oxford, but and it, you could not imagine anything more different. If you're interested, Google Blackbird Lees. It's tower blocks. It's like bloody burning bins. It's like gangs, gang warfare. It's sort of, it's, it's, um, Whoa. I mean, I'm maybe I'm making it sound a bit grimmer than it is. I mean, it's fine. I've walked around it. You know, it's and the people are very nice, but it is it is properly um, council estates and and people um, on the door. Like it's it, uh, some some of the people there are, are really struggling um, in a way that then nobody can be in places like Summertown and Jericho because the house prices are ridiculously high. Right. Um, but yeah, so the Botanic Gardens is kind of on that way, although you have, still have to go quite a long way to get to um, Blackbird Lees. Um, Botanic Gardens, um, yeah, it's next to Magdalen College. It's I, it's it's on the site of the old Jewish graveyard. So there was like a kind of wow ghetto, Jewish ghetto there. Um, but the Jews were um, uh, were ejected from Oxford a long, long time ago in the kind of Oh, I don't know, like 1300s, 1400s. I, I'm, I'm, I've probably got the date wrong, but the point is that it was properly long ago, centuries and centuries ago. Um, and uh, that that that's the old, um, just in front of the, the Botanical Gardens, that's the old Jewish cemetery. Um, inside the Botanical Gardens, they've made a thing of Lewis Carroll there. You, you, they've put a lovely statue of a Cheshire cat in the tree. They haven't really made a thing of the Lyra and Will connection, which I think they should. They should mention on brochure. I always ask whenever I go there um, about the Lyra and Will bench. Yeah. Um, I should explain for the people who haven't aren't familiar with the end of the Ember Spy Class, and we won't sort of be too specific about spoilers, um, or if you've just forgotten this detail. But um, there's an agreement between Will and Lyra that they will meet at this bench there in their own worlds. Um, that actually won't work very well because the problem with the Botanic Garden is they move their benches around. Because, uh, what, what has happened in the real world, in our world, I should say, is that someone carved Lyra and Will into, mm -hmm. into the bench. Um, but that bench moves around, which is a nightmare because they might have moved the bench in one world, but not in the other. So actually, I hate to say this, but it's going to be a struggle for Lyra um, again, the, in the Lyra's Oxford, you see that that is, at that time, that was the bench and that was where it was. Actually, I, having said that, I, I, last time I went there, that is still the bench and that is still where it was. And I did still see a little message about Lyra and Will carved into that. Unfortunately, some people were sitting on it, so I couldn't get a proper look. <laughs> um, so it's possible they have now started leaving that one where it is. Um, but certainly they don't make a thing of it. It's not in the brochure. 
Um, and I've asked the people who worked there a few times and they seem a bit puzzled. They're like, oh yeah, I think it, I think it's over there somewhere. It, you know, it's not like, oh, you, you must be wanting to see this bench. So I don't think many people ask about it. Interesting. Um, but it, it has become a thing. The other, the other thing to mention, of course, is in um, La Belle Sauvage, uh, the, um, what is it? The trout or the, it's yeah. the trout, isn't it? The trout. The trout. Yes. By yeah. God's still. By God's still. So that's a real place. I think we talked about this last time because I, I yeah, yeah. last time we met, I just, like a few weeks previously i'd gone there for my cousin's birthday um and i i asked the waitress like oh you must get asked about philip pullman all the time or you know what's the story does he come here all the time does he get free because he advertises the place so well in the novel and she said oh i don't know like i think i've heard i think i i think i know something about that but she wasn't really sure like she just heard a rumor about philip pullman like it kind of goes back to my point it was like just because you live and work in oxford doesn't mean you're like so thinking about this stuff you're you're thinking the same as you're thinking anywhere in the world like right i've got a i've got a double shift to do i've got a you know i've got i've got to work um i've got to put food on the table um you're not farting around in fantasy land thinking about benches <laughs> and um other worlds um but if you're interested in that kind of thing you can go to the bench in the botanical gardens you can see the um uh the hornbeam trees and if you do then you can pop over to the cemetery where R. Tolkien is buried um, and um, <laughs> and see the trap and skulls in the pit rivers yeah there's there's many little little details that i I would like to get to sometime um, hopefully we can talk again um, but i gosh, I will have to make a trip over there in person uh, someday and, and and get a proper tour of all this stuff. Um, so thanks for sharing some of your inside knowledge, like uh, going through the doors that look like you shouldn't go through them <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and taking the time to kind of show us around a little bit. Um, it's been really, really interesting. Um, You're very welcome. Um, I, I imagine we have to wrap up. Yes. But yes. Um, if, if I may say, can I say a few more just finishing yeah. notes? Please do, yeah. I mean, I could go on for hours and hours about this. I mean, because I, I, I had a look and, and, and to see some of these quotations or the passages where Pullman's referring to stuff. Um, for example, uh, Subtle Knife, Lyris let him deal with the bus. She sat there quietly watching the houses and gardens of the city that were hers and not hers. It was like yes. being in someone else's dream. They got off in the city center next to an old stone church, which she did not know, opposite a big department store, which she did, didn't. Um, now that's... Debenhams, where I was this morning trying to buy a pair of shoes next to St. Giles Church. And I know that's definitely where it is get off the bus that comes from Summertown. Like, they, they, there could be no other place. Yeah. Um, just like there could be no other cemetery apart from Wolvercote. You know exactly where you are when you're reading this stuff, if you know Oxford. It's very, very precise. Um, but that kind of idea of, like, you kind of know it and you kind of don't, that Lyra feels in our world is the feeling that you feel in Lyra's world if you don't, if you know Oxford, if right. you know our Oxford. And if you look at, you know, this map of Lyra's yeah, Oxford. Beautiful, beautiful. It's beautiful. And, the, and like you, you identify some things. It's like, okay, Christchurch is there, but Christchurch is called Cardinals, hmm. um, which makes sense if you know the history of Christchurch. But then there are other colleges that shouldn't, that should be there that aren't there. Um, so it's like, it's, he's shifted it just enough to make it kind of, um, um, what's the word? Um, uh, oh, what's that? What's that? Uncanny. Yeah, exactly, it's a, yes. familiar, but it's unfamiliar. Exactly. Um, which and, and there's a there's a little hint actually um, when uh, Lyra goes to the covered market, which is a well, it's a covered market um, in the Southern Life with the change she bought an apple from the covered market, which is much more like the proper Oxford. In other words, her Oxford. Yes. Um, Covered Market's kind of a bit bustly. There's lots of people there. It's, it's lots of kind of things going on. Um, reading the descriptions of Port Meadow in Northern Lights, there's like a dockyard. There's boats. There's lots of narrow boats. It's a, it's a bustling place. There's people bringing in fish and stuff like that. That's not the way Port Meadow is in our world. Port Meadow in our world is very sleepy. It's very beautiful, but it's like there's not much going on. 
Mm. So um, it makes sense that when Lyra goes to the covered market, she's like, oh, now this is familiar. And then we get a sense, okay, so that's the, one of the differences between our Oxford and Lyra's Oxford. So if you want to get a sense of Lyra's Oxford, go to the covered market. If you want to get a sense of Will's Oxford, go to the Hornbeam Trees, yes. and the um, Pitt Rivers. The, there's a little moment when Lyra notices a, a particular stone at the corner of Cat Street that's got the initials SP carved into it. Has somebody carved these initials into such a stone? <laughs> can you? I do you not know, but I, I will look that up. I don't know about that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to look that up. I'll have to, I'll have to come back on the show and, and give you an update about that. And also about the, the etymology of summertime, which I, could, I couldn't find, even though I Googled it. I, um, yeah, I suspect that it was, you know, whoever developed that area and wanted to market it, right? There's, there's some marketing going on. Probably, but who yeah. Knows? Who knows? Yeah. yeah there's, there's much to yeah. discover still. And and the the other thing um, in the Amber Spyglass, um, the little thing, I said the Amber Spyglass was at Stubborn Life. Once she was outside the museum, meaning the Pit Rivers uh, yeah. Natural History Museum, she turned to the park, which she knew as a as a field for cricket and other sports, and found a quiet spot under some trees and tried the alethiometer game. This the alethiometer then points her towards. Um, Dr. Malone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Works just next to University Parks. Now, if you're reading, sorry, next to the park where Lyra is currently in. Now, if you're reading this as someone who doesn't know Oxford, you're thinking, okay, this is clearly just the narrative, right? She's she's in a museum, and the author has put a put a park next to it, and then oh, it's such a coincidence that this scientist is right next to the park. But if you go to the Natural History Museum, there is a park next to it at the University Park. And the buildings next to the university park are all the science buildings. So yeah. it does work. Um, and it's such a small thing, but it's so satisfying when you know Oxford to, to know. I was like, oh, I know exactly where that is. And I know exactly how this all fits together. Yeah. And Pullman is, is just, um, you know, drawing on reality, but it, it's working in the narrative as well. Yeah. Could you, just to conclude here, um, mm. could you say a little bit about the character that Oxford is in these books? What, what sort of character emerges as you, as you read and as that is sort of developed throughout the books? Um, what, what do you think Gosh. about it? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a big question. And, and maybe, maybe I'll, I'll pass it on to, to the listeners as well, because I'd, I'd be interested to hear what everyone thinks. Um, I mean, I think Lyra's Oxford is one character and Will's Oxford is another character. I think Lyra's Oxford is a, is a kind of, um, excited child, um, but then we are seeing it through the eyes of an excited child, aren't we? But it is bustling. It's um, chaotic. It's 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 a bit more um, old-fashioned, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we see a different side of that Oxford in La Belle Sauvage because uh, Malcolm is is just on the outskirts of the city near Godstow, um, where things are a bit quieter. But yeah, Lyra is in the heart of it. the 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 heart of the the city of Oxford now is just full of tur tourists and students. And once the university students leave, the, um, the summer school students arrive. So it's bustling in a different way. Mm -hmm. But it, it, in Lyra's Oxford, the, Oxford is bustling with industry and with scholarship. Um, so that's part of the character of that place. And then the character of Oxford in one's world is, is a bit more mundane and a bit slower paced and a bit, yeah. I mean, I recognize that Oxford from my Oxford, but it's it's almost like, in some ways, it's like town versus gown. Mm. Actually, Will's Oxford is town, Lyra's Oxford is gown. Right. Um, and if you are a student in Oxford, uh, at one of the colleges, then you might think all of Oxford is about parties and high table and exams, and you know it's all kind of very intense. The students are only here for six months of the year. Mm. A, a term lasts for two months, so um, Michaelmas term in the autumn term and then Hillary term and then Trinity term, two months, two months, two months. So it's very intense. There's a lot going on, a lot of so societies and social events, a lot of exams, a lot of research. Mm -hmm. and, and that's Oxford for them. Um, but if you're a townie, Oxford is like the place where you earn your wage and you um, do the mundane stuff. Um, yeah. So that's, that's the way I would distinguish the two Oxfords, I think, uh, than the two characters. That's, that's really, yeah, that's really excellent. Um, 
I, I think, you know, part of reading these books must be about finding out that those two things are sort of two faces of, of the same coin, right? That Yeah, absolutely. You can sit on, on the bench, right? And you're sort of simultaneously in yeah. both of those places somehow. Yeah. Unless the bench moves and <laughs> you don't know where. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed it doesn't. Yeah, well, keep, keep, um, keep up the, the good work there, trying to get them to acknowledge the importance of uh, Pullman in all of these places. And um, more tourists like me should probably go there and, and demand to see these things so that they realize how important it is. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll have to talk again before too long. Um, thanks Fantastic. again. Fantastic. I look forward to it. Yeah. All right. And good luck with the rest of the Southern Life. I'll have to. I'll have to tune in to listen to some of the uh, the, the later ones. I haven't listened to any of your Southern Life series yet. Okay. Um, but it it's been a while since I've read this, so I need to, I need to read it again. I'll I'll tune into some of your other sessions. So good luck with with finishing it and getting on to the amber spyglass. I suppose. Yeah. It won't be too long. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you very much for having me. Okay. Take it easy. Thanks. You too.